We're going to start off the day today with a presentation on our more uh, moving to our more advanced calibration techniques and going to present it to us by Ben Hugo. Um, ben, over to you. All right, thank you so much, Ruby. Um, yeah, so as Ruby said, we're going to be continuing on to um, uh, interferometric calibration. Now, Ruby started this um, yesterday of a lovely discussion. Um, I'm going to be recapping what she said, so and then expanding on it to include um, full polarimetric calibration, at least um, at the pointing um, of the telescope. Now, I'm going to recap because this is quite a, a important and quite a, probably the most difficult topic of the entire series. Um, so it's good to just take a step back and look again at the uh, at the essential concepts. So let's get started. Um, now, at this point, um, you, we would have gone through the uh, uh, Fourier transform already. We've gone through the visibility space, and Ruby has discussed a um, introduction into this topic already. Um, now, calibration is all tied into um, a formalism that we use to describe the various different effects on the propagation of the um, electric vector that we're trying to measure from a radio source. Now, these effects can be fully encapsulated um, in what is um, called Jones calculus. So let's first have a look again at, at that formalism. Now, before we get started, let's just recap again what the basic delay tracking interferometer measures, the product correlator, as I said before. Now, the product correlator measures um, voltages, um, or the cross-correlation cross between voltages between different pairs of antennas, right? So you have different antennas, P and Q here. They're separated by some distance. They're measuring both the brightness of uh, the sky brightness. So that is in the far field. So at this point um, um, on the earth surface, the uh, incoming wave front as it travels through, uh, through roughly free space is going to be roughly planar at this point. So now the interferometer measures the brightness as a uh, induced power on the system and it measures the delay that it takes for this signal prop to propagate between hitting this antenna, let's say P, and the other antenna Q, right? And this is just given by the dot product between the um, source offset vector from where the interferometer is being pointed onto the baseline, right? Then what we get here is, as I said, the, uh, the intensity for the source. Let's say there's just one source, there's the density for the source, and it's being modulated by a cosine depending on this dot product um, that we're measuring with the interferometer. And this is roughly a, you can think of this as a spatial Fourier frequency that we are measuring, right? Um, this is for a point-like source, a very compact source. Um, as I said before, the cosine from there is only sensitive in the um, orthogonal direction. If we, if we don't steer it, we can steer it anywhere else in the sky by introducing an exponent, uh, exponent, right? And that will essentially just steer the fringes to be maximum instead of anywhere else in the sky if you want. Right. Um, all right, and then what we normally also do is, as I said before, we measure a sim component, and this component is just a phase offset of this correlated signal by 90 degrees, and that just gives us an interferometric response where the cosine bit goes into a knot, right? So it makes the, uh, the interferometer a bit more sensitive across a wider angle in the sky, right? The sensitivity of the interferometer shouldn't be confused with the sensitivity pattern of the antennas. Those are two very separate things, right? So the sensitivity pattern of the antenna is one of our most prominent directional dependent effects. So it modulates the signal um, across the sky. So it's, it's direction dependent. So the Fourier transform of this far field response gives us the grading. If we assume the grading is roughly constant over the source, then we have multiplication with the source amplitude. And this is this grading is ultimately dependent on direction, time, and frequency. The grading will scale um, uh, uh, if we uh, if we um, observe at higher frequencies. So the beam pattern shrinks. You can think of that that way. So 
this um, is one of the prominent or most prominent um, effects for at least for a highly directional system such as the VLA, ASCAP, Meerkat, Westerbork, you know. Um, then we also have the direction independent effects, which I indicate here as G, P of Q, so this is a neither matrix. And this matrix is also time and frequency dependent. The frequency dependent part comes from the orthomotor inducer, the measuring device, so the little dipoles and its little connecting pieces of cable and so forth, up, um, up to the digitalization bit, so including all of that LNA steps and things. Um, so those gain, so those bits of system will introduce an, um, both an amplitude modulation and it will introduce phase offsets. So it has an impeding effect on the system, right? So this is this is full complex um, matrices here, um, and they're time dependent. So you can think of cable days that change um, with time, for instance, um, because of uh, uh, because the system uh, temperature might be changing um, uh, uh, as, as a function of time. It can also be atmospheric, so there can be phase effects, and those are those usually primarily come from the atmosphere, especially at lower frequencies, right? And the atmosphere can also become highly direction dependent, depending on how turbulent it is at the time. So, but at, at the moment, let's assume there is some constant atmos atmospheric screen above a compact array such as Meerkat. And that will introduce a time variable phase differences that we that we do have to take into account. The um, as I said, the uh, uh, the frequency component comes from uh, the orthomotor tr transducers, so the dipoles, and they will have a frequency response. Um, uh, but that should be roughly constant because our engineers are very clever and they design the system and they cool down the system to be very stable. So. Those effects come from um, uh, 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 come from standing uh, wave patterns between our dipoles and the digitization step. So it's quite important to keep that path length as short as possible, and that's exactly what we've done with Meerkat, where the digitizer sits right behind the receiver. All right, so let's get on to the signal that we're trying to measure. Now, a, a radio signal uh, is polarized, meaning that the signal that propagates through, well, roughly free space, we're just going to say roughly free space, um, is a, a transverse wave, right? So it's, um, uh, so that electric component is, is transverse, so it means it's perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So you can see here on the right hand side, it's just taken from Wikipedia, um, as the signal propagates, right? It, the electric field that we're trying to measure is going to be well, uh, perpendicular to this direction of propagation. And we assume a roughly homogeneous and uniform and non-impeding medium, so roughly free space, right? There is usually some electron content within the ionosphere and within the um, uh, propagating medium, the interstellar medium, but um, we, uh, we assume that those effects are not too substantial. Right, um, then the most generic way we can describe the electron, uh, the, the electric vector as it propagates like this is, of course, that it is elliptical. So we have special cases here where that ellipse goes flat. So in that case, we have linear polarization or it can become fully circular. Um, in which case we have right and left um, and it's circular polarization. Now, for the linear polarization case, we can have uh, a vertical polarization or what we call um, plus Q, Stokes Q. We can have horizontal polarization, which is minus Q, or we can have also the diagonal. So 45 um, degree uh, polarized light in this X, Y um, frame. So what we need is at minimum, two dipoles to fully describe the um, this electric field. Um, if you only have one dipole, then you only you can only match about half the power if the signal is completely unpolarized, meaning that the signal has equal chance of going through the vertical or the horizontal bit in this uh, uh, as arbitrary aligned um, uh, plane here, which we're taking we're taking measurements in this x y frame here at the bottom. 
Now, so we need at least two dipoles usually. Remember that I said that the dipoles must be matched to the signal that you're trying to measure um, in my talk yesterday. Now, um, so we can have these linear modes, as I said, and we can also have fully circular polarization. And that is just a delay between what we measure on the, say, the uh, the Y hand, so let's say the um, uh, uh, the vertical mode and the horizontal mode, the X hand. Right. Okay, so the, this propagating wavefront can be described, fully described by two um, angles here. On the X Y plane, we have all linear modes, and this is described by this um, uh, phi um, here to phi, and. Um, then we have another angle describing how circular the signal is. So in this direction of Z, we have another angle, and that describes how circular things are. So if it's at the 90 degree position or minus 90 degree position, it's right circular polarized or fully left circular polarized. In that case, it has no linear component whatsoever. So this is called the point gear sphere. And it just gives us a visualization of the various different modes um, the polarized signal can take. So, as I said, so on the X here, um, so uh, we have the uh, uh, either the horizontal or the vertical polarization, and on the Y hand we have the 45 degree modes, right? And then, as I said, at the top of the sphere we have these fully circular polar polarized signals. All right, now that is for a uh, unimpeded um, wavefront that we are measuring, right? If if we have a system, uh, imperfect system um, that we're measuring with, we, remember this is real world, there's always going to be some a form of imperfection, um, or there's um, external sources of uh, propagation delays and, uh, and, and, and mod modulation, such as the atmosphere, for instance, then we need to be able to describe those effects to be able to solve for them, right? Because we need to be able to provide a model for the calibration to work, right? So we can just fully describe such effects, such linear effects. I should I should emphasize that all such effects are assumed to be linear, right? So they're non-depolarizing effects. So meaning that the uh, that the polarization polarization is vector is constant through. Uh, the integration, we don't average it out, right? So all of these effects are linear effects, and we assume that they're roughly constant within our uh, averaging interval, right? The matrix here has four terms, so it is a complex two by two matrix, as, as, as I indicated here. A, B, C, and D are all complex numbers, right? And this matrix here is the dot product between various different such two by two matrix matrices. So this is just the final product. We can decompose this into any number of matrices where the signal on the on the right on the right hand side here, the I of X, I of Y modulated by um, uh, some phase as this, uh, describing the propagation of the signal through uh, through free space, that signal is going to be affected by, firstly, by the first Jones term in uh, in, in, in such a chain called J1. Yeah, that's the first effect on the on the propagating signal. So that can be, for instance, the ionosphere, right? The electron content in, in the ionosphere will rotate the linear uh, polarization between the Q and U modes, right? So the, the horizontal vertical mode and the 45 degree modes. And then right at the other end, closest to the measured signal, so closest to us, the observer, we have this JN, and that can be, for instance, the cable delay. Right? That's, that, 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 that's, that's, that, that can be one effect that's, that's um, one of the last effects on the propagating signal. Right? Okay. This whole formalism is thanks to um, Robert, a guy called Robert Jones, which um, well, he was a UA. A US based mathematician. He worked for Bell Laboratories in his very early days uh, and later on the Polaroid company. So he invented this calculus 
um, to describe such linear prop, uh, effects on the propagating um, uh, complex signal um, way back in 1941. Right, so all of this is is really thanks to him. Um, the so as I said, this calculus only describes linear transformations, and this is very important. We always assume that the calibrate, calibrating the system is done within a linear regime. As soon as you go non-linear, as we said yesterday, all bits are off and you have lost your um, uh, your signal. There's nothing to be done if you throw away that data. Um, so, we, so I also just need to note that because these are, in the most generic case, two by two matrices, so non-diagonal matrices, they don't commute, right? So two by two, the multiplication between two by two matrices, if you remember, back to your linear algebra from university, don't in a general case commute, right? Um, yeah. So let's have, um, let's look at some examples here. So we already showed you uh, some uh, some examples like this. I just want to recap them. We can have, for instance, a complex gain matrix, which we assume as roughly diagonal. So the, the, there is no covariant effects between uh, between these uh, these gains um, for both x and for, for the y um, a mode of the system. So let's assume we are working in a linear basis. We can also work in a circular basis. But for me, I've got it's linear basis, so I'm just going to stick to linear basis for now. So this complex gain matrix is a diagonal matrix. So examples of this can be both time and frequency dependent. So there's Band, a bandpass can be described like this, for instance, in CASA um, and in other so uh, software packages. Um, we can also describe um, time variable effects. So, uh, so if the system has an amplitude drift over time, it's not temperature stabilized, then it will also be a gain matrix, right? Um, then we can have, uh, if we assume that the, that the feeds are not perfectly horizontal and vertical, so they have some non-orthogonality to them. So one of the feeds is measuring some power that should only have been measured by the other feed. Then we say there is some leakage be uh, between them. And we indicate, in, indicate this by a leakage matrix uh, such as this, which is one on the diagonal, and this dx and dy on the off-diagonal. Some also put the minus before the d of y here. It really doesn't matter. That will just be absorbed into the tab. So it really doesn't matter. Note that for this, uh, to be able to decompose this non-orthogonality of the system um, uh, from the um, diagonal gains where we assume that there is no uh, um, uh, crosstalk between these um, different uh, di dipole, measuring dipoles, um, we assume that the leakages are small. So they must be much, much, much less than unity, right? For Meerkat, it's typically on scales of percent level, so it's much less. So this decomposition works reasonably well. Okay. Um, so then we also can get a phasor matrix, which is a special case of a complex gain matrix, right? It just has unity on the amplitude and some phase attached to it. The phase can be, again, temporal or frequency variable. This is a very important matrix, and it, it can be used to describe the uh, Fourier relationship, so the geometric relationship that interferometer uh, measures. It can also be used to describe um, uh, delays. So a, a cable delay. So a cable delay will um, appear as a slope in frequency, right? Um, because it's just a uh, it's just dependent on mu to the first power. Um, so all of those can be described in this kind of formalism, right? Um, so this is one of the most important matrices. Remember that the, we calibrate the, the phase of the system um, to be able to make it, uh, ultimately to make an image. So, and the phase of the system is actually, I would say, the most important bit to get right, right? If you don't get the phases right between the various different antennas, then you're not measuring a coherent signal and everything is going to be smeared to bits. Okay. So as I said before, these matrices, in the general case, do not commute. If you have a set of diagonal matrices, for instance, though, they will commute between themselves, right? 
Um, if you have a constant matrix, it will commute anywhere in the chain, right? Um, as soon as you have matrices that have non-diagonal terms, so these leakage matrices, for instance, or a rotation matrix, such as the um, uh, parallactic angle rotation you get from alt azimuth mounts, then those terms do not commute with the rest. So please don't mix them up. They, it will not work. All right. Um, so as I said before, we can concatenate this into a chain of matrices, multiply them together, and get another complex two by two matrix out that describes the fully describes the all the linear um, uh, effects from different polarizers on our signal that we're measuring on some antenna P. We're just measuring. Uh, we're just considering one antenna at the moment, right now. Now, the as is, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, oops, sorry, the correlator will dump it, its integrated uh, voltage, which we then square to get the power out, um, between the hands of um, an antenna P and an antenna Q, so two different antennas, um, in this form, right? So we'll have a Joe's matrix P that affects the electric vector from antenna P. Then we have a Jones matrix um, from Adena Q, um, which is just a, um, uh, a complex conjugated. Um, and we have a, and that affects a electric vector from that Adena Q. Now, if we do the maths here, we can rearrange these terms to put them into what we call this onion form, right? Where all the, uh, all the Jones terms affecting P is on the left-hand side. All the Jones terms affecting um, Q is on the right-hand side. At this point in time, we have channelized our signals. So we have, we're have we measuring um, using an FX correlator. So remember that we take, we can take a Fourier transform of our, uh, of our induced voltages in time to get a, uh, a, a, a spectrum for it, so short-term spectrum. So you can take a short-term fast Fourier transform with some appropriate filtering to do this, for instance. And that's what it's done within the Meerkat correlator. And at that point, because we are in the Fourier domain, we can multiply these electric vectors. So everything is just a multiplication of this step, and it acts as the cross-correlation product, right? So if you if, uh, if you remember that a correlation in one space is a multiplication in the other space, so this is why this is a multiplication. So in this case, we have the electric vector, as I said, from the antenna P, right, where it's just located here in subscript, and it's multiplied with the electric vector coming from Q, and the two, dif uh, two different modes on these two different antenna, so the vertical and horizontal mode, for instance. Now, what we're assuming here, as I said, is that everything is linear, everything is non-depolarizing, so these terms must, JP and JQ, must remain constant or very close to being constant throughout this averaging interval, right? When the averaging interval is just given as this square bracket notation here. In that case, we can take the Jones terms out of the uh, out of the integration period, right? Because they're roughly constant, and we can solve for them. If they're not uh, constant and we average for way too long, then all bits are off. The signal is essentially uncalibrated. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the, so let's have a look at the Meerkat processing system because I just want to tie all the various different effects back to physical effects on, on the signal. So in the Meerkat system, you'll recall this from Justin's talk, uh, um, we have the receivers on, let's say, antenna one um, in the core sitting, uh, uh, sitting away from the processing building. Um, those receivers are uh, are mounted on uh, on what is called a feed indexer, where we have space to mount uh, four feeds. Currently, there are three for the most part. We are currently commissioning um, the east band receivers, and uh, so so for the most part, there are three receivers per antenna, and so this is indicated by this RX, yeah, RX one, RX two, RX three, RX four. Each of these receivers measures both a vertical and horizontal mode, so there's a little of vertical and horizontal dipole in each of them. Um, then that receiver itself uh, will um, amplify the signal, so there's some low noise amplification circuitry in there. 
Um, that signal is digitized. By digitizer that sits right behind the receiver. Remember that you want to keep this distance between them as short as possible um, to, to reduce any standing uh, standing pattern wave patterns on on the on the analog um, component. <coughs> Sorry. So I have a bit of a cold. So please excuse the odd cough here and there. So both these modes, so this vertical and horizontal mode of that receiver is being digitized into two separate, uh, separate streams. Um, the digitizer keeps a timestamp and it uh, just timestamps those signals. It sends it via fiber to the processing building, right? Um, where it goes through a, a commercial switch, well, probably some of the fastest switches currently available on the market. Um, right, so the switching system will redirect the signal onto uh, uh, onto the channelizer. So the um, channelizer is called the if engine, as Justin has said, and as I said yesterday. Um, this if engine applies to, for the engineers out there. It applies a polyphase filter bank to the signal, which very uh, finely channelizes the voltages and it prevents leakage from one channel into the others so just some technical technical terms there but it it gives us a fully transform of our of our time based signal at short intervals right those channelized uh voltages are then again sent through the switch to the correlator which correlates between different um uh, antenna pairs right so it just does this multiplication as i said and then that signal is shipped off to the science data processor, which captures the signal and it puts it in, uh, in, uh, in a defined format into the archive for your downloads. Um, the system has a maze of clock that drives the um, uh, that drives the, uh, the digitization system. Um, we don't heterodyne on the um, Meerkat, uh, so we capture the, uh, the signal at nitrous rate, so it's really high rate, so it's, uh, so it's on the scale of nanoseconds, so that, um, that we're capturing um, the raw voltages. So all of this is driven by our very precise maser clocks um, sitting in the processor building. Um, and then we timestamp that signal via GPS timestamping to get UDC times out. All right, so let's zoom into that front end bit though. The, as I said, we have a receiver. Let's look at the L-band receiver here. The receiver has two little dipoles here, horizontal and vertical dipole. This is called also the author mode transducer, some jargon. Um, and that signal from those two dipoles is then passed through a two-step um, low noise amplification um, circuitry, right? Um, and all of this sits in a cryogenically cooled package at kept at about 22 Kelvin just to keep things stable so that those um, reflective wave patterns on the analog component is kept as stable as possible and they don't change with time because that would be a nightmare that that would mean that the frequency response of the system is variable which is not a good place to be and it makes calibration way way harder and it actually will prevent us doing um, certain line sciences all right, so everything is cooled down. The, after the, this two-step two LNA um, process, we pass the horizontal and vertical component into a digitizer, a digitizer which, take, um, uh, which take the analog signal and put it into digital, so for an ADC for each of these H and V. And then the signal is timestamped and, uh, and some, some preliminary filtering is applied and so forth, and it's sent through to to the process of building. Here on the far left hand side, I've just shown um, uh, shown the waveguide for um, for the receiver. Right? So it's, it's a little on waveguide. And the bottom of the waveguide, there is these uh, water wave dipoles. Right. All right, so let's schematically illustrate all the various different things that can go wrong. All right, so right at the front end, let's assume that the signal has passed through free space, there's no atmosphere. There's, uh, there's no electron content here that can corrupt the signal. So let's let's say the first effect that we hit is the antenna far field response, and that's the predominant 
direction dependent effect. That far field response, ro uh, response rotate over time, right? So you uh, have a rotation in the linear component, the Q and U components, um, with time. So that is driven by the by the mounts that the antenna sit on. Because they sit on alt azimuth mounts, you have the this parallactic angle rotation coming into play that rotates uh, the um, uh, that rotates the uh, far field response as a function of time. Um, and it can also have a arbitrary, each of these receivers can also have an arbitrary offset from the horizontal. So it, it may be slightly tilted with respect to the nominal horizontal. So we have two, a concatenation here of two rotation matrices, essentially describing this time variable effect, right? Remember that the far field response is also a frequency effect because the far field response um, shrinks as we increase in frequency, right? Um, just because of the similarity theorem um, that will be pointed out way back in the beginning to you. So this is a time and frequency variable effect. If you have, um, I'll show you some examples for the VLA, which is far worse than Meerkat um, in terms of this far field response um, a bit later on. All right. But getting back onto, uh, onto effects that is introducing across the entire sky, um, uh, 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 this, this entire, well, this entire, I should say, this entire primary load pattern where we usually take measurements at. Well, those system effects can, is, in, is indicated by, by these various different types. So let's take a look at them. We can have, as I said, we can have non orthogonality between the two little dipoles, right? So they can, one of them can be misaligned with respect to the other and then measure some of the signal that should have been measured only by, say, the horizontal mode here, right? Those two, um, dipoles are connected to through the um, uh, low noise amplification circuitry to a digitizer, right? That low noise amplification circuitry um, has a, a standing wave on it, and this is the bandpass response of the, this orthomode transducer circuitry. Um, and that just gives us a amplitude and, well, I should say amplitude and phase effects that are these kind of like ripples and, uh, and modulation as a function of frequency. Um, then each of these digitized signals it, from, from one antenna, right? So the, both the H and the B mode from let's say antenna zero is going to be channelized by a single F engine, right? So they're connected through some cable to this F engine. Now this cable can uh, in total, can have a cable delay, right? Usually, this bit will be negligible. The F engine is uh, everything is digitized at this point. So, but then on our, on an analog, um, fully analog system, there will be cable delays throughout the system up to the correlator bit. So this this difference in path, right? Um, so this impeding uh, difference is can be described as a slope, right? Where this uh, in phase, where um, so it's a certain frequency as indicated here. So phase is on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis. We have a slope. That slope can be shifted up and down. So it is described as a K matrix and a constant offset in phase G matrix, right? So this catch-all matrix that Ruby has been talking about. So so that fully describes the uh, this this impeding. Um, uh, uh, effect of, 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 of the cables that connects everything. All right, um, those are the most the, uh, the most prominent effects. Those these are um, so that is an off diagonal effect. That's, that's minimal. It's about one percent of meerkat. Um, this cable delay effect is usually one of the larger effects. It's somewhat predicted already for you by the meerkat online system. So you'll see cable delays on the order of nanoseconds usually. So everything is already connected by, uh, or corrected for you by, but if you look at the raw, raw Meerkat data without any pipeline corrections, this will be thousands of nanoseconds. So it's, it's everything is already at some level of correction when you get the data. Now, I should also point out that um, you can also have a delay term between the two different feeds here, and that is called the cross hand delay. So Ruby indicated uh, the measured, I think it was the measured visibility is X. 
please don't confuse the here. I, I use X for a different uh, reason here. Um, X indicates the, uh, the, the delay between the signal that is measured on H and the signal that's measured on, on V. So they have uh, the, so this is a delay between those two signals. So, um, and that is the definition of circular polarization. Um, so the system is inducing its own circular polarization in the system and we have to calibrate this up. This is by far the most dominant term um, uh, in the entire system. The Meerkat online system will inject a uh, noise down signal, so for a quarter wave splitter, um, into these two chains and it will ca calibrate as much of this away as possible. It uh, will be still a few picoseconds worth of um, this feed delay left. So you have to calibrate that out, that out using external polar, polarizer. We'll get onto that a bit later on. Um, but this is one of the most predominant polarizing effects on the system. All right. Um, so let's look at the rhyme and, and concatenating all of these various different terms together. So uh, I'm going to use this E, e measure here to describe the, the complex voltage that is induced on the system. And remember that as we integrate with our correlator, we square those voltages and we get the visibility function out. So the square of the of the interferometer grading, as we said yesterday. Now, this measured vol uh, voltage is already corrupted by the various effects from an antenna index I, right? So it's just the antenna index here in the subscript. So now we have, at uh, closest to the observed signal, we have things like the cable delay, this K term, which is a frequency dependent term, which is usually stable of time or very roughly stable of time. So it's roughly only a frequency dependent thing. Then we have a temporally variable gain, which is um, going to be, a, 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 is going to contain both an amplitude and a phase, right? So this can vary over time. The system, the market system is cooled down um, as I said, so the amplitude stays quite stable over time, actually. It's just the phases that drift substantially over time. So this is, on Mirka, this is usually phase dominated, really. Um, then we have the orthomotor and steel. So as I said, we have standing wave patterns between the, the dipoles and the digitization step. Um, those standing waves are frequency dependent, and they're usually, because they're kept at a stable temperature, they usually remain constant. Um, and uh, say about 1% um, level um, for, for, uh, for a few hours. So it remains quite constant, right? So this is just what we call the bandpass response. So it's the frequency response of the system. Then we have the cross and delay. As I said, we have a delay between the two measuring uh, or to measure um, uh, bases, so the vertical and horizontal bases in this case. We have leakages, so the non-orthogonality bit coming in. We have the antenna response. Um, we, uh, the CASA people indicate that this is A. We indicate this is E. So tomatoes, tomatoes, same, same thing. This is the most prominent direction dependent effect, right? So this it depends on uh, on cosines L and M, right? Because it's a Fourier transform of this far field response, which gives us the grading, which we assume is roughly constant over the source, so it's just a multiplication at this point in time. If it's not constant across the source, if a very extended source, for instance, then there's a convolution involved here, and it's, uh, it becomes slightly more complicated, right? That would be an integral here. Um, then we have the parallactic angle, right? P Jones which is just because of the Aldazimuth mount. If you have an equatorial mount, such as the Western board telescope, this term is not there. It, there is no rotation there. Um, then, and yeah, I should just point out, in the linear feed system, this is a 2x2 uh, two two rotation matrix, simple Euclidean rotation matrix. And for a circular feed, it's a diagonal phaser um, that affects only uh, only the, the linear components of the system, not the intensity. Um, right? The intensity modulation comes in from the uh, from the far field response, which is rotated by this speed matrix. Right? Okay. Um, then we have the geometric delay. As I said, that K matrix uh, or the, the phasor matrix can be um, generalized to encapsulate this. 
Um, and this can be a uh, frequency dependent. So that, remember that we measure baseline in terms of wavelength. So it's a frequency dependent matrix of the dot product between the source offset vector on the baseline, right? That describes the geometric relationship between the sky and what we measure with an interferometer. And ultimate, and then ultimately, sorry, oops, we get the in the perfect um, signal, right? So the signal that the, um, before it's been um, uh, 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 before it's been uh, uh, introduced to all these very various different effects, and that is just the intensity of the source, so um, uh, the specific intensity multiplied by the um, uh, by the uh, by an angle here describing the wave as it propagates through, through roughly three states. All right. All right. So that is a simple illustration of what we call the radio interferometric measurement equation or RAI. And this can be arbitrarily flexible, right? This is just one incarnation of this beast, right? There, we can make this direction dependent, introducing a, a uh, if we want to, uh, if, if we're observing a multitude of sources across the entire sky, there will be a sum here, summing over all the sources, mod each modulated by its own little direction dependent effect, right? So this can be arbitrarily complicated. I'm just showing you one incarnation of this. We always assume that the, for any integration interval, as I said, that these effects are roughly stable for both the antenna P and the antenna Q, right? Okay. Now, the relationship to Stokes, I've already alluded to this, but let's formalize this definition. According to the, uh, the IAU convention for a linear feed system, um, then uh, the vertical mode plus Q is defined upwards, right? So, um, and the horizontal mode minus Q is defined towards the east, right? So, and then the electric vector um, is, uh, rotates north through east through this 45 degree mode, right? Um, and these, so, uh, so this, so this describes just the handedness of the um, linear, uh, linear angle for any polarized signal, right? The, an unpolarized source, as I said before, has roughly equal power on X, X, and Y, Y, right? Um, when in this case, we've, we defined X to be in the vertical direction. Um, it can also be defined to, um, as Y in, in this case. So just be careful. Um, so these terms, um, so they get added to get total intensity in this case, right? Um, well, why do we measure roughly equal power? Well, the, an unpolarized signal will have equal chance of going through that measurement plane that, that, that our dipoles lie on, right? So that's, that's why they have equal power, right? This, this, is, this is all just statistics basis. It's not that they have perfectly equal power, they have roughly equal power, right? Um, so to get total intensity I, Stokes I out, we take the an addition of the uh, uh, of the correlated x um, x of p and x of um, q plus the correlated y of p and y of uh, y of q. Right. Um, the 0.5 here is just because of software convention. If if you open up your measurement set database, then things are defined to be um, uh, each of these correlations only store. Um, We'll store, well, we'll store twice the amount of power. So we have to take a factor of five here, of, of 0.5 here to, to get the intensity out. This, is, this factor here is just because of software convention, nothing else. Um, but I, I include it because this is the accepted software con, uh, convention um, that you will see in the data. Um, then right circular polarized um, sources are defined as the Y component lagging in phase behind the X component. Right. So, um, as, yeah. So, uh, 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 as you've seen before, you have a, a, if you have a circularly polarized signal, then one of the ends is slightly lagging behind the other one, and this is why if we have a phase difference in the measuring device in the antenna itself, 
um, between those two hands, then the system is inducing its own circular polarization to the signal. And that is that is that cross-hand phase that I was referring to. Um, so yeah, as I said, vertical points north, horizontal Q points, uh, points north east. All right. Okay, so how do you calibrate the signal? So the calibration is done just as a least squares, right? Um, we have a data vector, we have some input visibilities that have been corrupted by some various terms, indicated by a model that is dependent on some gains, right? Those Jones matrices, right? Um, and we're trying to minimize over that vector, that, and that gives us the, so that vector describes a, a error function for us, so the error vector, right? As a function of parameter. Now, if we want to minimize, of course, we need to differentiate the model with respect to each of the uh, uh, each of the um, uh, the argument terms, right? So that gives us the Jacobian. Now, if you look at the Jacobian, um, the Jacobian is just a matrix of the first derivatives of the model term relative to the parameters. So these are the model terms, and these are the various these x's are the various different parameters, right? So you'll have the first model term in the top row differentiated with each of the different parameters. And then, um, so uh, we do this um, uh, same thing for the second and so forth and so on, up to the last model term. Uh, and that is, the model term is again differentiated with each of the various different um, uh, parameter uh, terms, right? So it's just this delta in over delta x. Okay, um, so if we take a first order Taylor expansion, so we're doing a gradient descent to be able to, 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 to minimize the step, then what we're going to get is just the transverse of this Jacobian matrix as we defined it, um, multiplied by this difference between the data vector and the model vector for a parameter. And we're, for each step, in this process, this gradient descent process, we adjust it by uh, a small delta in the in the gain terms, right? And we want to minimize over that, so that should go towards zero. Right? At, at that point, we have found optimal parameters, right? The space can be quite complicated, so the, so this process may not necessarily work, but um, for the most part, this minimization works reasonably well. All right, um, at least for a well-constrained problem, that is. Okay, so as I said, this delta A term is just an iterative solve of the normal equation from starting with some initial guess um, uh, where n is zero, right? This can just be randomly initialized or set to some uh, uh, some uh, some uh, value that is, uh, uh, that's a good guess as an initial starting point, and it's iteratively updated with small steps. Right, I'm showing you you here just the Gauss Newton. There's various different implementation of these squares. I'm just showing you the simplest one. I'm not going to go into various different optimization methods. That's not what this lecture is really about. Um, all right, and if we assume that the rank of the data vector is equal to the rank of the um, uh, of the gain vector, which is not the case. Um, for, for a radio telescope, it's, the data vector is normally much, 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 much bigger, orders of magnitude bigger than the number of um, the degrees of freedom that we're trying to solve for. So it's only Newton's method if, you know, if, uh, yeah, indicated here if these ranks are the same, but it's not the case for a radio telescope. Uh, not in general, case, of course, if you have very small. Um, telescope it, you know, you, just, you may start approaching this kind of thing. All right, um, then for, let's bring this back, this general least squares um, discussion back to um, how we formulated our, our rhyme, right? So for a given time and frequency interval in this, uh, in this data, um, in this aerospace, so data, data minus model, so we've, we've chunk this up in time and frequency bins, right? Where that those bin sizes are dependent on signal to noise. I'll get onto that in a bit. Um, so for any given such interval, um, the vector, this error vector is defined between um, the data, so the visibility point taken between antenna 
T and, and M and Q, minus the gain modulated model, right? So we plug in a model. If we have a calibrator source that is con uh, that's very compact, then it can be a simple delta scale, right? So it could be just a, 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 a constant function in time and maybe a slope and frequency describing the spectral response as we had with our primary calibrator yesterday, right? This, uh, um, this is all modulated by a gain term that we're trying to solve for dinner P and the dinner Q um, individually. And we do this over all possible spacings. Um, so spacing speed Q in the Cartesian product of the set of antennas. And we usually, um, we discard the autocorrelations. As I said, they contribute noise for the most part. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so we also, in practice, we separate the components usually in terms of real and imaginary for this complex optimization process. Uh, at least in CASA, in our packages, um, uh, 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 we we use Verti uh, Vertinger um, derivatives to define complex optimization. But um, for CASA, at least, it's split in the real and imaginary. And this is the traditional way of doing it. All right, so for the calibration, as I said, we vectorize the real and imaginary part of the data vector. So we construct this data vector for real, and then another one for imaginary, and we solve for them individually, right? Um, with, uh, without consideration of how they tie each other. Um, the model vector, uh, vector is genera it's generated in some ma manner. Either we assume a model vector for a calibrator, or we construct a model through imaging, and, I'll, and that's, that will bring us to self-calibration a bit later on. I'm not going to go into further details there. So we have the data vector, we have some model vector, we are then creating an error vector, so an error function. And we initialize our gains to some some value, some initial guess. We call these squares in the SciPy optimize pack, just as an example of how to how to do this in practice. For both the real and the imaginary, then we reconstruct a complex uh, vector um, G, which uh, which is which is an amplitude and a phase. And then we repeat the above for each time slot or time frequency slot, depending on how you carved up your data. All right, so now that we've discussed the uh, review of the theoretical session, uh, section with um, some discussion on polarimetry, we are going to look at transfer calibration procedures for both calibrating the diagonal and the polarimetry response of the system. Right. So let's just take a step back and look at what we mean by transfer calibration. Now, the receiver, orthomotor, orthomotor and steer set, and the filtering transmission line infections um, associated with that um, dominates the electronic uh, or direction independent diagonal term, like this band pass term that we were describing earlier on. Non orthogonality bits, so the leakages, um, are really quite invariant with time, right? So they, they may have some frequency response, uh, frequency um, a structure to them, but they're designed to be relatively co uh, constant. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we can calibrate for them once. We don't have to continuously calibrate for them, but we need to use um, external sources to be able to calibrate them on the external celestial sources. So, um, so as I said, both the thermal and mechanical tension on the transmission lines, if you have a fully analog system, um, those may induce time variable phase differences in the arrival times of the voltages at your correlate, right? Um, so this is primarily an effect that really drives errors on older analog systems, right? Um, but in practice, because the engineers have, um, have uh, designed the system to, be, to have a stable frequency response, within some temperature range, so this is why we cool our telescope, um, we can decouple those frequency variable effects, oh, oh, um, yeah, frequency variable effects and time variable effects. Right? So we can, in principle, decouple the bandpass response or the frequency response of the system and its temporal cable delays or atmosphere or whatever response. Right? So two separate solutions in this case. And we can only do this because the engineers have done a fantastic job. So curious to the engineers. Um, 
Um, so we, so basically, what we do is we solve for these various different effects using using calibrated fields in the first pass. Um, so our calibrated fields, what we our ideal, our, our gold standard calibrated fields have some criteria to them. They are a point source, right? So they're unresolved source at the face tracking uh, at the face tracking center, right? So they're and so there's no structure to the source. There's also minimal um, contribution from sources all around that source. Right? The sources are, 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 are uh, sitting out there by themselves. There will always be some contribution from off-axis sources, especially if you have a large beam that you have with me at that. Um, but we assume that there's a minimal. Right? Um, and that is that will be a gold standard calibrated, I should say. And those are few and far to do. Um, now, as I said earlier, we bin our our, our, our solutions here in time and frequency. What drives those bins is primarily signal to noise, right? And um, for to, to capture time variable uh, effects, we need proximity to our target field to account for any atmospheric constant phase variations of time. All right. Um, so the the signal to noise is given by this equation here, and this equation tells us exactly how long we need to integrate to in order to get to some signal to noise. The calibrator flux in Jan's case is indicated as S here, so that is a square term here. We have the fractional bandwidth per solution. So let's say for the Meerkat wide band um, element system. Um, the port of course channelization, this channelization is about 208 kilohertz. Um, if you go, go up to 32K um, uh, data, it goes down, uh, I think it's about 20 kilohertz or something like that. Um, so this just gives you the channelization step, right? And your desired solution variance in, in this wells is indicated here by this dB. Right, so let's say you want uh, very uh, uh, you want better variance than twenty dB. You plug in twenty dB there, and you plug in the, oops, the system equivalent flux density of the system here in this uh, ACFD, which is about four hundred twenty-five Janskys average across the um, L band system. About the same for the, for the top part of U band, going all the way up to about five, between five and six hundred. Um, Janskis um, at the bottom of, of, of the UHF system, right? This divided by 60 tells you in minutes how long you need to observe your calibrator for. This does not take into account any effects from RFI. Um, usually we observe the calibrators for much longer, right? Um, because we have RFI in the signal and we want to flag things out and we want to wash out the RFI, I'll get onto that a bit later on. But this gives us just the estimate of uh, the minimum time needed on source. Okay? So now, the basic observation strategy is indicated here. Here we have three, three sources. The black one here is, uh, is the source PKS 040865 in uh, uh, J2000 uh, uh, epoch. Um, then in this magenta year, we have another um, uh, calibrator field, that's the J0252, right? That's just another calibrator field, but slightly closer to our target. And that field has amplitude that is much less than our, uh, our primary calibrator, right? Uh, which we will use this very bright um, PKS0408 for. And then finally, in, in, in blue here, uh, uh, I just indicated track in blue, it's indicated here in orange, here in the amplitudes. That is our target field, and it's the D2 field that uh, Justin has shown um, uh, in his lecture, if, if you recall that, that deepest yet L-band field um, uh, in his lecture, that, that this is the field I'm referring to. Now, what we want to do, we need a lot of signal to noise. Remember that the signal to noise that we can achieve the pins uh, uh, on, on the channelization. If we if we increase channelization much, much wider, then the instantaneous noise on the system will go down and we need less time on it, right? 
Um, but if you want to channel, if you want to solve per channel a game, a complex game for the system for each of the X and the Y dipoles, then we better have a source that is really bright so that we can do this quickly, especially at fine channelization options such as the Infinity K or the even worse, the narrow band system of 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 the attack Right? For those, we really need a really bright source, and we need to observe it for quite some time to be able to solve. All right. So, so these black lines, uh, as I said, refer to uh, 0408, and that's going to be used as our primary calibrator. It's a gold standard calibrator. It's unresolved, minimal structure around it, on the order of, of contributing only about a percent to two percent level at L band. So minimal structure around it. So nice, well well defined spectrum is well known. Flux is well known. So this is going to be our flux calibrator, it's going to be our spectral calibrator, um, and we're going to use it to, to calibrate per channel. Now, we take those solutions that we derive on, those, uh, on, on that primary calibrator, because it's quite far, it may be quite far from our target field, um, uh, you know, it, it can easily be tens of degrees away, and we want to be able to solve for it time variable effects, so primarily the, the atmospheric effects, um, so constant atmospheric phases in frequency and in direction, so roughly a constant screen that, that slowly changes with time. We can solve for those gains using our secondary source, which is the red one here, or 252. It's fainter. It's still quite compact. Um, I believe this is still uh, unresolved, so it's, it's getting close to a gold standard, at least for, for secondary source. And we saw for the phases using that source. I should note that if the source is uh, is resolved with the telescope, you better make a model of that source before you uh, use it to calibrate the phase. Um, because what we assume during our secondary uh, calibration step, um, uh, which we have done yesterday, is that still that the source is very compact to, uh, to the point of being completely unresolved. The model that uh, that is that CASA uses internally in that case is a unity model with flat spectrum. And that unity model is only valid um, uh, if you if you recall um, if you have a delta component in the in the image plane. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, not all sources are like that and it's you should really carefully inspect the corrected visibilities after you've uh, you've done your secondary calibration. Because if you've made a mistake there, you will do more harm um, than actual good on your target field. Right. Okay, um, so we take then the, these time variable effects, which we solve for um, in between target scans of this deep two field, and we get the solutions for that, and we interpolate it onto the target field coupled with our band pass. So the typical observance strategy you'll see for, for not just Yerga, for, for, for most uh, 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 imaging telescopes um, or imaging interferometers is we observe a bandpass calibrator, we observe a gain calibrator which we use to primarily correct the phase of the system, and we take the solutions of the bandpass, interpolate it onto the gain calibrator, so the secondary calibrator, and in turn interpolate both of those um, solutions onto the target um, calibrator. Normally we disregard the uh, the any time variable phases in the phase offsets in the band pass, and we just use phase offsets of the game. This will give us a really good calibration, um, transfer calibration strategy. All right. So as I said, bias now for the um, for the primary calibrator, interpolated onto a lower SNR source, interpolated onto our target field. Typically, we solve for a slope, so this the, uh, this cable delay in terms of frequency on the uh, on, on the primary when we solve for it and on the secondary when we solve for the gains on that right because it, 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 it might it might have changed slightly we solve for a constant offset in amplitude and in time uh, oh, sorry amplitude and, uh, and phase as a function of time so this gain matrix and we have uh, solved for a B matrix which is dependent uh, on frequency, and that is the amplitude and phase response um, per channel uh, of, of our system. 
I'm interpreting all of that on the authority. This is this KGB um, calibration. All of these are um, diagonal terms, and the uh, KGB should not be confused for the uh, Russian, old Russian secret police. You know. uh, yeah. All right. Um, so the uh, so as I said, the primary driver of our integration solutions is SMR, right? the uh, SMR posterior, right? As we, um, uh, as we integrate our solutions for more, so it, as, our, as we increase our, our error vector with, uh, with many, many more samples as a function of time, or uh, the, you know, the, the posterior error, error in the SMR goes down. But again, you're going to start hitting a point where the temporal effects on the system um, isn't constant anymore. So there's this usually the sweet spot between how long you need to solve for to get good SNR and how long you can maximally solve for um, keeping the gain terms constant within the solve, uh, the solve interval that you've defined. Right? And this yeah, this, this is a systemic environmental variability is primarily driven um, by things like the ionosphere, where it changes um, uh, over, uh, over the course of an observation and, uh, and that may, may have structure to it. So, um, so things like that will drive this, you know, this, these structural temporal changes in, in, in these game terms. Right. So let's look at diagonal calibration, right? So remember, we are we're calibrating these KGB Jones, right? So this secret agent Jones um, over here. So these are indicated just combined as a uh, G term, G of X of, on antenna I, G of X on antenna y, uh, J, and the uh, same for the other mode of the uh, of the of the off mode and user, so the, the other polarization. So what, uh, polarization Y, Four antennas I and J, respectively. Typically, what we use is a unpolarized emitting source, so a source that has essentially no polarization. That 0408 is one of them. It has linear polarization at a level much, much below a percent level, so more towards the 0.1% level. Um, and same goes for uh, PKS B1934. So the one, I think that's the one that you used yesterday. Um, either way, they are unpolarized and therefore they don't have any linear Q response on the diagonal, right? So they only have an intensity response um, in this case. There's also no U, so there's no, no leakage from U back, uh, back into I, okay? So yeah, we just have the total intensity. We know this very well for the source, so this is used for our, to set our flux scale on the system, and it's used to create the spec. All right. Um, all right. So, as I said, oh, well, um, Ruby has shown you this um, uh, yesterday already. Um, don't only look at your gains. They don't give you the full picture. The proof of the pudding really is, is really in the eating. Um, you look at the amplitude and phases, or uh, equivalently, the real and imaginary parts um uh for your calibrators you look at the amplitude and the phases as a function of uv distance for instance everything should be flat as it will be said in in uv distance because the source is um is unresolved as soon as you see start seeing structure in that then two things can kind of occur either one or more of the antennas have gone astray, they, they, have, they have large temporal issues or they're dropping out or something of the sort, or your calibrator is starting to become resolved. And at that point, you need to tread very carefully. You need to image your calibrators in that case, and you need to um, construct models for your calibrators in order to correct the phases. So be very careful um, and inspect your visibilities after you correct for them. So as we said yesterday, if we have a point source on the sky that is not resolved, then we're going to have noise on the system, right? There's always going to be some form of noise. I've been neglecting the noise a bit when I discussed the Jones, uh, Jones terms here. There's always, as Ruby said yesterday, there is going to be an um, uh, uncorrelated noise, but that stems primarily from the low noise amplification circuitry, um, at least for, for Meerkat. Um, 
So we're going to be correcting both the intensity and the noise. So what we should be seeing here for a source that is a point source on the sky is a constant function in the uh, in the visibility space. And that function is as a constant amplitude and no phase, right? That's that, 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 that's what we mean by constant function. As soon as that source is, for instance, offset or it's been resolved and you start seeing fringes and uh, uh, and this plot can no longer be used. So if, if you start seeing things like that, things have gone very wrong in your modeling step. So you need to go back and model things carefully. So for the Uncalibrated data, you'll see a large spread in the phase. So there's there's various different phase delays and constant phase offsets between all of these various antennas. They also don't necessarily have the corrected amplitude, right? So um, here, the correlated counts have been corrected to some degree um, already, but this is not necessarily the case. This, this uncorrected amplitude can be anywhere. It can be a thousand in this case. It, it has no units attached to it. It is just some uh, measure of uh, the uh, number of correlated dumps, right? Um, once we've calibrated, though, this should go into a ball, right? Um, so this, this large spreading phase should collapse and become close to zero because that's what we expect. Uh, if you have if you have a delta uh, in the image space, you have a constant visibility. For across the entire UV space, right? And if that is unresolved, then everything should be constant, right? Across all baselines. Okay. So the key here is to visualize, diagnose, calibrate, and rinse and repeat, right? It's, it's very important to visualize. Okay. Um, then we get onto the on axis. So where the telescope is being face tracked and pointed at. Um, correction of our leakages and our cross and phases. This is the post KGB step, so the post diagonal step. Um, a linear system response. If you linearize the uh, the Jones terms there, um, and this D and this is implemented in CASA. The, I'm taking equations uh, that are directly implemented in CASA. Um, then the linear system response is going to measure on the x hand um, plus Q. And on the y hand minus q, so in this case, um, uh, x, uh, x here is going to lie uh, in the uh, horizontal, uh, in, the, in the vertical position, y is lying in the horizontal position. So con uh, converse to what, we've, uh, what I've shown you. So but that's just convention, really. Um, so on the diagonal, x, x, y, y, after we've created for the KGB Jones terms, um, so we remove them by correcting for them. Then we'll be left over with Stokes I plus minus this Q plus some leakage from um, Stokes U into this mode. Stokes U is on the uh, is on the off diagonal, right? So uh, X correlated with Y between these two antennas, and Y correlated with X conversely, and they measuring the um, the conjugate response. Of, uh, of of circular polarization, really. They're both measuring U and then plus or minus um, imaginary, uh, imaginary year multiplied by Stokes V, right? Q, U, and V can range all between plus or minus one if we normalize them by the I power, right? So they, they're a fraction of the of the total um, intensity that is emitted, is emitted by the source. All right, so um, in this case, we have the, these two bits as a per, uh, in a perfect system, but because our system is not perfect and there is leakage, these D terms, right? Those leakages are leaking I primarily um, into this response. Remember that I is going to be much bigger than the unnormalized U in most cases, so it's primarily stuck I. Uh, it's also leaking um, uh, Q here into the off diagonal terms, but to a minimal degree. The, the, the primary leakages are really I into this, and this is what we need to correct. Even so, the leakages are only percent level, so it's not it's not that big to be honest. What is 
A bigger problem is the cross and phases, so the delays between the X hands and the Y hands for each of these antennas, right? Um, those will serve to rotate linear polarized U into circular polarization. So it will give a circular, the system will give out a circular response to a linearly polarized signal. That's not what we want. And this can be arbitrarily large if uh, on Meerkat if left un uncalibrated. Normally, because we inject a noise diode signal to calibrate for it in the first order, um, this is much reduced to the level of about um, 50 to 80 picoseconds left over. So uh, that still needs to be calibrated out. It's still it's still too large to be comfortable. It's still the primary error of 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 of, of uh, in the in the, in, the, in the polar in the polar in measuring the polarized signal. A circular uh, system such as the VLA is defined slightly differently. On the on the diagonal, we are measuring I plus or minus V. So I plus or minus um, uh, circular polarization. On the off diagonal, so the uh, right um, right-handed circular um, feet cross-correlated with left-handed circular field uh, feet on between the two different antennas, we are going to measure Q plus or minus I U, right? So only the linear bits, right? And now, um, again, we have uh, the cross and phases, but this only serves to rotate the linear bits between themselves, right? So, um, uh, uh, so, so it's, it's much. This is actually a much simpler system to calibrate than a linear feed system such as Meerkat. Um, now, again, we have leakages here from I into this um, uh, primarily. Um, there are higher order terms to these uh, to this to this equation that describes, for instance, um, I leaking into itself, right? So you uh, you you may have a you you, you may have a, uh, you actually have a bit of bit more I than or less I than you should have just from second order leakage effects, but those are in the minus forty dB range. So they are in the point zero zero one range. So they're 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 really minimal, to be honest, but you can see them on really bright sources, such as your free C sources, for instance, or, or, or even on, on our uh, PKS-1934 calibrating, uh, you still see second order leakage effects. Now, but I'm, I'm only going to keep it simple and constrain things to the, to the first order effects. Now, um, we also have parallactic angle, which is indicated here um, by this phi term. In the Linear feed, this is a rotation matrix, a simple um, two, uh, two by two rotation matrix. Um, in a circular feed system, it is a, uh, a complex exponential that is only affecting the, the off diagonal. So only the um, linear response of the system, not the diagonal response. It, it only comes into play once you start having leakages, right? In the in the diagonal case, so if you want to see more of more of discussion on this, please refer to Christopher Hale's um, 2017 paper. Um, he really does an excellent job at summarizing this. So if you once you've calibrated all of this in a linear system, and your feeds are normally nominally aligned, then you'll get out the uh, a correct measurement for the polarimetric response. That is, if you don't have ionospheric effects coming into play, the ionospheric effect uh, corrections are done as a separate final post-processing step, right? Um, so for a nominal system situated in free space with perfectly aligned feeds, this will give you the correct linear response. All right, so the uh, on-axis uh, transfer calibration um, a leakage transfer calibration goes as follows. So we have calibrated our frequency and some time variable responses using KGB at this point, um, using a source with uh, no linear or circular polarization. Um, then uh, we switch to a linearly polarized source, so uh, AG, uh, AGN, so something like a quasar, with a strong uh, or reasonably strong polarized response, such, such as a uh, uh, 36, which is roughly about 10% um, polarized, which is one of the brighter AGNs, uh, or, or, or should I say the brighter polarized AGNs. Um, and that's all should have a known polarization angle because we're going to be using that afterwards to correct 
for ionospheric um, uh, uh, um, rotation measure offsets in, 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 in measured angle, but it should have a known polarization angle here, and it should have power at the um, point where you observe it. So the parallactic angle, remember, will rotate the U power into Q and vice versa. So at certain points in time, there will be no power on the cross and phase uh, on, 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 on the cross and measurements. So at these points, you cannot calibrate for these terms. So you have to very carefully plan this. Um, currently, it's not supported in our observation planning tool. Hopefully, it will be um, supported soon. But if you're doing the, uh, if you're planning to do um, pol polarization measurements, you should really carefully plan your observation and take this into account. <clears throat> so now. Using this highly linearly polarized uh, signal with its known polarization angle, and it, ideally it should also not have Stokes V here, um, because that's what we plan to calibrate out, essentially by setting the the, the ideal V response to, this, uh, to our corrected visibility to zero, then we can solve for this X Jones as I defined earlier on. And it's just a cross and phase as a function of frequency and function of time. Usually it's quite time stable, right? Uh, the, uh, these delays are, are, uh, and phases, phase offsets, so the, the impedance is quite stable with time. So it usually can be done just once and transfer them. All right. This gives us essentially something that is now corrected for systematic circular response. And now we switch back to our unpolarized source, right? Um, so our PKS 1934 or our PKS um, 0408 or 3C 147 at Aldine, for instance. Now, at this point, these any power on the cross hands for this unpolarized source is coming from leakage, right? Uh, especially from from our I uh, I mode, but also from the Q mode, right? And this are the this off diagonal D Jones, as I've said before, these D terms. All right, um, once you've corrected for that, right, then you need to check your conjugate hands, right? The, as I said before, the, just quickly go back, the conjugate hands, so x, y, y, x correlation is measuring conjugates in, uh, in, uh, in Stokes V, so in, in circular Stokes. For a source that has intrinsically no circular polarization, most AGN doesn't. Um, uh, if you look at stars, they may have high uh, fractional Stokes V, so brown dwarfs uh, and things like those in the continuum may actually have some Stokes V. Um, pulsars, for instance, neutron, neutron stars also have, um, at least some of them, have really, really high Stokes V components, but for most AGNs, they don't have Stokes V. Uh, so it's actually a good a good diagnostic to, to, to check um, on, your, on your final fields as well. So as we're measuring conjugates uh, in Stokes V, this uh, this bit of here. So um, I've plotted um, the the diagonals. So x x and y y. So this purple and the orange bit here, and the red and blacks is the cross end. So the x y and y x. Those have to lie on top of each other. There there is no circular polarization for the source. Therefore, they're real. And they have to, they're both measuring plus u in this case, and they have to lie on top of each other, and they have to be constant as a function of time after we've removed the parallactic angle, which we pre compute. That is just a geometric thing, which we know well in, in, in advance. We don't have to calibrate for it. We just pre compute it and apply it. Okay. I should note that once you've applied parallactic angle, you shouldn't go calibrate any further on that corrected visibility during self cal. The, as I said, those matrices don't commute. So, so please don't make that mistake and, and calibrate. Try to calibrate further on on post panactic angle corrected data. You have to go back to the un, uh, to the data that is in the uh, feed frame, and then self cal and reapply the panactic angle correction um, and so forth and so on. Um, so yeah, I've just plotted here also the real and imaginary component. Remember that we set the imaginary component for this cross hand. Uh, Terms must be zero, so they're centered at zero. They have some real uh, component, which is just Stokes U after correction. This is the, the intrinsic angle for the source if there is no strong ionospheric effects um, or very large feed offsets, which we don't really have from the aircraft. Um, so feed offsets will induce effects of only about a few degrees at most. Um, 
so yeah, so they should uh, nominally be a line like this, and then the the diagonal terms so the x x and y y is way up here because that's remember that is i plus or minus q, and that is that explains the offset that we have over here. Okay, so as I said, for linearly polarized source, no circular polarization, x x is con is equal to conjugate of y x. All right, so. At this point, I'm going to conclude. Um, uh, if you have any questions, we can discuss them now. Um, also, feel please feel free to contact me on my email address, which is peer at sk.ac.za. What we're going to be discussing later on a bit is now that we've corrected the deformator response, we can image, and then we can come back to calibrate them further during a process of self-calibration which I will discuss in a bit more detail tomorrow. But really, self-calibration is, is just taking the next step and just, as Ruby said, making a model of the sky through this imaging process, uh, which we did involve the sky. And we use exactly the same tools as we used before. So exactly gain cal and uh, uh, in, in some instances, the bandpass cal operation um, in order to calibrate further the time variable responses of the system. I'll also show you some directional uh, direction dependent examples. We won't be doing any practical work for that. Um, it's quite advanced um, and doing it with CASA is, is quite hard actually. Um, there's many steps um, involved uh, in the CASA calibration and we typically use, for instance, um, the cubicle package to, uh, to calibrate this and, um, uh, and also, um, uh, the QLMS package to to apply solutions within image space um, through a process of faceting. So all of that is very advanced, though, and I'm first going to take you just through direction independent self calibration tomorrow. But first, we have to discuss imaging before we get started on that.